Good afternoon, everyone. So, lots of people interested in Kotlin. I should say I'm really happy to see that, except I have to speak about it for the next hour. Um, one word of uh, advice, shall we say. So this session was advertised um, as being delivered in English, yeah? Um, the problem is I am from Northern Ireland, and I am from an area in Northern Ireland that is renowned for a rather impenetrable accent. So maybe this may be the first session today delivered in double Dutch. <laughs> if anything, uh, if I uh, fall into my, my home accent at any point, say anything that is uh, indecipherable, then please just tweet, huh? At D3Z, okay? And I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, Honestly, though, if I, because it's very likely that come to the end of the, the session, I'll have had so much left to do that I'm going to try and race through it. And I'm going to start speeding up, and you're not going to understand a word I say. So please do uh, raise a, uh, a hand if that does happen. So, methods are no fun. Now, purposefully, possibly trying to be in Sanjuri within a Java crowd, but everyone gets the pun. Who has looked at Kotlin already? You see the, the subtitle, right? An introduction to Kotlin? Yeah, okay. So you get the pun, of course. Uh, with Kotlin, one of the big things we now have as Java developers is functions, top level functions at that. But we'll, we'll come to look at that uh, shortly. Uh, and so it's not that uh, Kotlin is any more of a fun language. We're not going to go down the, the Ruby route of try and tell people that our language is going to make us smile and be happy. Uh, but at the very least, Kotlin should introduce some concepts into our coding that make things less frown-inducing, shall we say. Firstly, who am I? Quick introduction, because I'm sure that no one here knows me. Hi, Mom, I'm a conference speaker. Um, my name is Garth Fleming. Um, I work in a, a company called Instel. We're a small but growing consultancy in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. Uh, I'm a developer and sometime trainer at Instel. You can get me, should you so wish, at garth.fleming at instill.co, or as I've mentioned before, D3Z on, uh, on Twitter. So what is Kotlin? Well, we might as well uh, start, get the word from the horse's mouth. Straight from JetBrains themselves, this is how they describe their language. Kotlin is a statically typed language for the JVM, Android, and the browser. Now, there's actually only one of those things that we really care about, which is JVM. Any Android developers here, actually? OK, so Kotlin probably came to uh, prominence recently because it promised to provide all that Java 8 goodness that we miss as Android developers, which really just means lambdas, right? That's all we really want. Um, of course, with the introduction of Android N uh, and the promise of Java 8 support, that may become less of a, less of a selling point for Kotlin, um, but s knowing the, the rate of acceptance or adoptance of Android, it's going to be, what, another two years before 50% of people are going to be on N. The browser one is the bit that stands out from everyone. And just coming from Mark's talk and noticing that Kotlin was in his list of uh, JavaScript languages, Kotlin did originally, and still does, uh, compile to JavaScript. The uh, JetBrains, though, decided for the release of Kotlin 1 that they would de-emphasize the JavaScript thing and kind of not talk about it for a bit, because it wasn't embarrassing, let's face it. Um, but they have said in a recent roadmap that they are going to reintroduce or, or uh, ramp up the efforts again to get uh, JavaScript support back there. So when that happens, we will have a language which specifically or principally targets the JVM. 
currently is the best language on Android if you want the Java 8 uh, type support. And well, if you hate yourself enough, compile to JavaScript, which will run on the browser for you. So JetBrains, everyone, who uses IntelliJ? Okay, I should have asked, who doesn't use IntelliJ? Are you using Eclipse still? Okay, it's still free, I guess. But um, so JetBrains uh, are the people developing uh, Kotlin. Now, it's important to know that, and JetBrains, I think, are quite keen that people get this, is that Kotlin is not a new language. Okay, they're not like a uh, flash new kid on the block. Kotlin has been around for years now. It's just that up to now, JetBrains have wanted to keep it to themselves, okay? So who uses the rest of the JetBrains suite, like Upsource, uh, Team thingy? That thing that, yeah, that with Team in its name? That's the one, Team thingy. Uh, lots of their backend services have been written in Kotlin for years now. Um, and actually, here's a, here's a tip for any would-be conference speakers, okay? Uh, if you're ever told, or, sorry, if you say you will speak at a conference, um, you have two routes to go. Okay, either you pick a subject that you know everything about, and then you can come and be authoritative about it, and everyone can look at you and think you're great. And all the sessions I've been to today have fallen into that, that category. Or you can pick something that you think is going to be um, unknown enough that you can sound authoritative about it. Um, the first. Uh, the first didn't apply to me, because I don't know everything about anything. Um, and I picked Kotlin. And up until when I said I would speak here, Kotlin was pretty, well, pretty unknown amongst Java developers. We did notice, though, that JetBrains were making a bit of a push on the language. And when 1.0 was released, suddenly everyone was talking about Kotlin. Jack Wharton, everyone know Jack Wharton? Android developer at Square. Uh, built, made retrofits, uh, all those uh, great libraries that we know, constantly on about Kotlin, okay? So now all of a sudden I'm here thinking I was going to talk to people who had never heard about Kotlin before and sound good, and now everyone's heard about Kotlin. But this is how JetBrains describes their principles, okay? That they, they apply to the development and design of Kotlin. First of all, they want it to be a pragmatic language. Now, for them, pragmatism means pragmatic, okay? Unlike some languages that may be designed from a purely academic platform that may run on the JVM as well, and may, whose names may start with S, um, Kotlin was designed to answer real-world problems first, okay? Uh, so that's what they mean by pragmatic. So every decision that JetBrains makes in the development of Kotlin is to be pragmatic, okay? It's also designed to be concise. No one can accuse Java of being a concise language to read. And we all know that's mostly down to checked exceptions, right? But anyway, enough of that. Kotlin was designed from the outset to be concise. And we'll look at some of the language constructs that they introduced uh, to answer that very that principle that they have. It should also be safe. Now, as Java developers, we're used to having a safe language. And the, the JVM, for very good reason, is the basis of lots of language because one of the things that guarantees us is a certain level of safety in terms of memory, in terms of resource management. And Kotlin wants to take that a bit further by answering one uh, one issue that we as Java developers still, uh, still maybe have, but we'll come to that in a second. And of course, no language on the JVM is going to be terribly useful if it's not interoperable. See, there's the accent, interoperable. I should have changed that to something else. It should work with Java, all right? And they've put uh, great effort into making that so, and we'll see that as well today in our time together. Um, Okay, so firstly, a quick overview of the language itself. So it should go without saying that Kotlin, basically, it compiles down to standard bytecode. They have done nothing with the uh, JVM. 
They have done nothing with the bytecode that's produced. And most of the times, it could be argued that the Kotlin code that you're writing is syntactic sugar, or at least making certain patterns that you use in your Java code concrete in the language, OK? But what gets produced by the Kotlin pilot compiler is just basic uh, bytecode, um, normal bytecode. And in this case, for the current release, that's Java 6 uh, particularly. The reason they stuck with Java 6 is obviously to sell the Android support as well. Uh, but on the recent roadmap for Kotlin, they've said that they will be moving to uh, pick up support uh, for Java 8. Because there's obviously some optimizations in the JVM that they're missing. Uh, but they're going to move to that uh, very soon. The other thing that we need to get used to when you come to Kotlin, uh, which is a complete turnaround from your Java code, is that everything is closed by default. Okay, So no class can be extended by default. You must explicitly mark a class as open. And not only that, you must also explicitly mark any method within that class as open in order for it to be uh, extended by uh, subclasses. Now, that's any, anybody doing any C Sharp as well? Or? Right, so that's not a big thing. You're used, you, you're used to that as well. But Java developers, where everything's open by, uh, by, uh, by default, that will be a big change. Now we'll come to look, oh, hopefully, if I don't go keep going for too long, uh, we'll look at when it comes to the interoperability between Kotlin and Java, then sometimes, obviously, there's, a, there's some leeway there. For instance, uh, 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 you have to keep Java interfaces open, for instance, or classes open, but we'll, we'll come to that. In terms of uh, main um, uh, units within Kotlin, we have, as we said, functions. We still have classes, and we have objects as well. Objects, classes are distinguished between each other. Any Scala developers in the room? Is that a happy thing or a half and half? OK. So um, the one class of JVM developers that have the hardest time with Kotlin seems to be the Scala developers. Uh, because every time you tell them or say, Kotlin allows you to do this. Their immediate response is, Scala has allowed me to do that for a long time now. Or Scala can do that too. Um, and it's fair enough that Kotlin has borrowed quite a lot from Scala. I don't think there's any secret from that. Um, the way I look at it, though, is, is Kotlin, Kotlin kind of feels to me like a, uh, like a refined Scala. You know, like... Um, Think of an analogy that's not going to offend anyone too much. Um, crude oil, okay? Crude oil is refined into petrol, yeah? They're both oil, right? But there's only one of them you'd want to put in your car to make it go fast. And that's how Kotlin feels to me. It's like a refined Scala, almost. Don't, don't, can you edit that bit out? OK, the other big thing, no checked exceptions in Kotlin. Um, anyone got a hard time accepting that? No, great. Oh, emphatic, emphatic nods of the head. That's great. And the other thing is all your existing code will work uh, with Kotlin. Now, that's important because there's no way anyone is going to get their new language adopted anywhere, never mind the enterprise if you cannot reuse or use your existing infrastructure and your existing investment, OK? And when we say, when I say that all existing Java works with Kotlin, I mean all the frameworks you're currently using, uh, all the libraries you're using, whether it be for logging, for unit testing, all your web frameworks, all of them will work 99.9% .9 of the time with Kotlin, with no, uh, with no problems. And it's also the other way around as well. You can write units of your, pro your projects in Kotlin and use those without problem in your existing Java projects as well. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll look at uh, some examples of that. So our plan for our time together, and it's a very loose plan, because uh, an R feels like a long time when you're preparing. Uh, but in execution, it turns out not to be the case. So the plan, we don't really have the time to go into a deep dive on syntax or for syntax, OK? So we'll not be looking at loops, and we'll not be looking at how you define classes. 
hopefully all the syntax stuff that we're going to talk about will fall out of code demos and stuff that we'll look at. So other than that, we're not going to be spending time looking specifically at syntax. We're not going to be spending an awful lot of time looking at any of the Kotlin-specific tooling. Anyone who's already using IntelliJ, you simply install the Kotlin uh, plugin, and you're good to go. Um, anyone who's not IntelliJ, there is an Eclipse plugin, I believe, I think. But you're probably best. Go to the command line. Far better. Uh, so of all the features that Kotlin provides, uh, we want to concentrate on four in our time together. Uh, they are null safety, or nullability. Uh, not gullibility, that's a JavaScript thing. Um, higher order functions, and we'll look at that as well. Extension functions, which again, C Sharpers should be uh, happy enough with, but is new, I think, on the JVM. At least it's a, a unique thing to Kotlin, I think. And then we'll look at some examples of actual Java interoperability, working with Java uh, as well, OK? So null safety, NPE. Does that strike fear into you? Did that make you squirm? No. Why not? Just, we call that Stockholm Syndrome, right? <laughs> NPEs, null pointer exceptions. OK, so we've all had them. Um, how does Kotlin try to save us from null pointer exceptions? Or how does Kotlin handle null specifically? And why have I called it out as a, as a thing? Well, here's our first piece of, ja of Kotlin code. Var message, C sharpers are already going. This is C-sharp, surely, as well as possibly the JavaScripters as well, which is more of a worry. Um, the type of uh, message in this case is string. Now, var, anyone going to hazard a guess? Var means variable. We have another keyword we could use in that place, val, for value or an immutable uh, value in that case. And that, uh, now the Scala people are going, we know that forever. Right. So var message of type string, and again, string in this case is uh, optional. Kotlin has type inference as well. And we set its value to hello world. Now, for whatever reason, because we're sadist, we'll set message to null. OK? And the Kotlin compiler says, no. Null cannot be a value of a non-null type in, uh, of Kotlin string non-null type. So to make this code com compile now, not run, but to compile, we need to change the code to say this. We've changed the type from string to nullable string, OK? And the way you change the type to its nullable type is you put a question mark on the end. So now we can quite happily set message to null. Why would you have to send message to null? Well, this is more useful when you're, you're interacting with Java code, I guess, OK? And there are, again, sadists or Stockholm Syndrome sufferers who use null for all sorts of things. Who uses null, for instance, to say something didn't work? And then you get if null, bleh. Yeah? OK. Kotlin doesn't like you having to say if not null or if null. Okay, so it tries its best to stop you from having to, to write that. So we have a uh, variable now, and its type. Now, this is the important thing. Its type has changed. Okay? Its type is now nullable string. Okay? Not string. Okay? So we have our message variable, which is now a nullable uh, value. And we want to call the or get the length property from that object. And Kotlin says, no. What are you trying to do? This could be null. That's unsafe. OK? So what the compiler is actually telling you is the, the way we're trying to access length in this case is unsafe, because message could be null. All right? So because of that, rather than uh, access the length property directly, 
we need to change that to this. Okay? So this is the safe operator. Question mark dot. Basically what will happen here is if message is non-null, we'll call the length uh, property on it. If message is null, it will return a nullable value, or null, basically, okay? So uh, message length in this case will be null. If message is null, message length will be null. What's the type of message length? Nullable int, right? Yeah, nullable int. I, I wasn't going to do this, but we might as well. So let's look at that. So I'm just running the Kotlin, uh, Kotlin runtime, or Kotlin REPL, okay? Which if you install Kotlin on the command line, uh, Kotlin C will get you into the Kotlin REPL, okay? So uh, let's see. Let's write a method. Fun. Uh, let's say fun get message, and it's Return type is nullable string, okay? And let's actually return a message, okay? Now, two things. We have declared a, or a function. If the, your functions uh, are only a single expression in the body, you can rewrite them in this uh, short term, or this short uh, form, uh, which is simply equals and return the value, okay? So if we call get message, it will print message. No, yeah, no worries there. Now, if I call this, what's going to happen? We get an error telling us that we can only use the safe operator. Okay, if I use the safe operator, what's the result going to be? Seven, because message wasn't null. Okay, now here's the thing. Message might be null, is what we're saying. If message isn't null, we will call the length property. If it is, um, oh, I didn't make, oh, I should have done that. Should have returned null instead. Uh, in fact, let's do that. Let's return null from our function instead. What's the other thing missing from the end of the line? Semicolons. Yeah, because who needs to type another character? Right, so we'll call get message again. It returns null. If I call get message, see if operator length, now the answer is null. Okay, very good. Now let's go back to our previous example. So we're going to return a string this time. And we've already seen that if I call this, the answer is seven. Sorry? Type error. Uh, okay. Any other suggestions? What's the result of this? Nine. <sighs> Infix call response to a dot qualify call. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Now, this hides a slightly um, another, shall we call it a feature of Kotlin? Plus, in this case, is actually an infix function. Okay, and it actually in the Kotlin language delegates down to a, f a f actual function called, in our error message, plus. What would that suggest about operators in Kotlin? They're just functions which can be overridden, yes. So Kotlin does have a form of uh, operator overloading. Each of the infix uh, um, operators will delegate down to a function call on the receiver, which you can override with your own functionality. So what's happened in this case is we have a nullable. When we called length on it, the result is also nullable. So when we've tried to call or do a plus two to the length in this case, we've tried to call a nullable or tried to call a function on a nullable uh, object. And so, I'm sure there's a cleaner way to do that, okay? I hope so, because I'm not selling Kotlin to anyone with that, all right? But that, uh, the Kotlin, the, the nullability thing is there as much as possible to catch the fact 
uh, or to make null explicit. That's really the aim of the question mark here. As Java developers, we're never quite sure when something can be null. We just don't know, let's face it. Especially when you're calling third-party code, okay? That's why we've got if not nulls all over the place, okay? So why not make null explicit in your code, okay? By making it explicit, uh, it's much easier to spot where null is a possibility. Now, uh, le well, let's come on to this first and then we'll talk about uh, an, um, a problem I see with that. But the other, uh, our earlier error message also said that not only can we use the CF operator, we can use this bang bang. Anyone? Well, it's not called bang bang, I'm just going to call it bang bang. But calling it bang bang basically tells you what it's doing. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. It's like, I don't care. You know, die if you want to. I love MPEs. <laughs> All right. So, bang, bang, you're dead. Okay, so if message is null in this case, it will still try to call length and throw a null pointer exception, okay? There are times where you may want to do that. I wouldn't think it's very often. And the last thing uh, to do here is we have our length uh, call on our nullable message object. What happens if message is null? A call to length will return It will return null. Oh, sorry, is it? Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. How do you, how do you Java developers survive that? <laughs> Nell. Oh, okay. I will try to remember that. Nell. Okay, so if message is nil, uh, and we call length on it using the CF operator, the result will be nil. Now you're confused, my brain's gonna melt. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so what we have at the end there with the question mark colon zero is what the Kotlin guys have affectionately coined, and if you look at it this way, it's the Elvis operator, okay? And basically it's the if null, then that, all right? So if message is nullable, uh, is null, sorry, nil, null, oh Jesus. And the call to length returns null, return zero instead, okay? Now, this actually sounds like a really good idea. They're gonna be listening, aren't they? This making null uh, explicit throughout your code sounds like a really good idea. The problem being, well, it's not a big problem. The question mark actually becomes infectious, okay? And by that I mean it infects all the code in a call chain. All right, so as soon as there's a nullable somewhere in a call chain, every result that comes from there is nullable. And you'll find yourself typing question mark, question mark, question mark, and then you'll forget, and then the compiler will complain, and then you'll put the question mark in, and then you'll keep going, and then you'll do it again, and again, and again, and you will learn to hate the question mark, okay? So, as we've evaluated Kotlin in install, what it's actually forcing us towards is using null objects instead, okay? So rather than rely on null at all, don't rely on nullable types at all, and rely more on null objects, okay? The null object pattern, okay? Even if it forces us to do that and make our code slightly more explicit, that's probably still a good thing, all right? So values in Kotlin must be explicitly declared nullable with a question mark. Once it's been declared nullable, you must op use the safe operators, or the bang bang, if you really want to. Uh, but once it's been declared, it must be, you must use the safe operators on it. There's this notion of a safe cast, which we didn't look. Um, so while I'm asking questions, are there any Swift developers? In the one, okay. Uh, so you're used to as, the as keyword for casting types. So Kotlin uses the as keyword to cast types as well. If you want to cast a nullable, or if you want to cast uh, a class that may result in a class cast exception, if you use the safe cast, which is as 
question mark, it will return null rather than throw a class cast exception. But uh, it's very unlikely that you'll run into that, I'm sure. Okay. That's null ability in Kotlin. Everyone is racing out now to download Kotlin right away and change all their, their projects to it, right? No. Okay, let's look at higher order functions then. With higher order functions, there's two things we need. Okay, we need to be able to return functions from other functions, and we need to be able to pass functions as arguments to functions. Okay, now it sounds weird in a Java context to use the word function, but in Kotlin we do have high order functions, and we have top level functions as well. But let's look at this. Now here's an example. Here we have a function called lock, okay? And you'll see T, generics. Generics work pretty much the same way in Kotlin as they do in Java. There's a few quirks, but we'll not, we'll not get into that right now. First argument to our function is a lock object, lock of type lock. Can the lock, revision question, can you pass null as the first argument to this function? Excellent, let's move on. Okay, so the next argument to this function is another function. It's called body, and it's typed to a function from nothing to t. Okay? So it's a function that will take no arguments and return a t. Yeah? And basically all we're doing in the, the body of the function then is calling lock on our lock object and then calling the body function that was passed in there. So basically we've synchronized the call to the passed in lambda, or the passed in function there. And this is the way you would call it. You call your lock function, you pass in a new lock object. Now this is creating a new object. Anyone notice what's missing from that? No new keyword either. Excellent, we're just dropping keywords left, right, and center here. All right, so no new keyword. We all love Python, so why not make it look like Python as well? And then we pass in our function as our second argument. And what you see there with the braces is the syntax for uh, anonymous functions, okay? Now, in this case, Kotlin has an extra little trick, I guess, an extra little feature for you. If the last argument of your function is a function, you can rewrite it to look like this, okay? So you call your function with all your non-function arguments, and then you create or you pass the function, I'm saying function far too many times here. Your, your second argument flips outside of your function call uh, brackets and look like the body of a function call in that case, okay? Now, this works with any function, as long as it's the last argument in, in your function uh, signature. And also, uh, this works as well with uh, Java interfaces. So SAMs, okay, single abstract method interfaces that we're all used to with click listeners and all that sort of nonsense. Um, they can be written in this form as well, okay? So if the last argument of a function is a function, you can take the function body out of your parameter list and write it as the, the body of a function outside. So, we want to be able to pass functions in as parameters, but we also want our functions to be able to return functions um, when they're called. And here's a, an old useless example called makeAdder. MakeAdder will take a number as a parameter, and it's gonna return a function of type int to int. Okay, and we'll see that the return uh, of our function here returns, and there's a few ways we can, uh, we can write this, and we're gonna see that now. We can use the fun keyword inside here to make our function. Uh, our, we're gonna return a function that's gonna take a single int argument, which is gonna return x plus y. Now, importantly, slow down. What does that tell you about functions in Kotlin and their uh, where they're called from. They are closures, okay? So, 
Functions that are returned from other functions are closures. So they will close around their current state, okay? So you'll see that the returned function closes over the x parameter of the outside function and returns x plus y in this case. So that's the rather wordy way of writing it, but you would call it like this. You simply call the make adder function with your first parameter. The thing that gets returned will be a function of int to int, which can be called like any other uh, function uh, before. Now, as I said, in our first example up there, the make adder function, we can rewrite how we return in that case with slightly more succinct uh, uh, syntax. So rather than use the fun keyword in our second return, you can use what we saw in the previous slide, which is just wrapping the body of your function in braces, okay? So you'll see uh, what this example shows you is uh, an anonymous function or a lambda that takes parameters, in this case, y. The parameters will be listed, comma delimited, with a colon separating them. Okay, sorry, the colon is the type. It's the thin arrow that separates them from the body of the function, okay? And we can reduce that even further because our make adder function, its body can be reduced to a single expression. And as we saw a couple of slides ago, we can write any function that returns a single expression by simply using the equals sign there, okay? So we can write this. So this is a function that returns a function. We can use this syntax to make it slightly smaller by removing the fun keyword there in the body of our function. And because our make adder function is only returning a single expression, we can reduce that even further to this, okay? And it's called exactly the same way. Those three uh, versions of that function all uh, act exactly the same way. So higher order functions, lambdas and anonymous functions are supported. Uh, subtle difference between lambdas and anonymous functions, but uh, we saw both there. Now, both have access to their closure, so as we said, um, higher order functions in Kotlin will close around their uh, enclosing state. And function calls can be inline. No, we didn't say that. So if you uh, add the inline keyword before a function, the compiler will inline the call to the call site. Okay, every call site. All right. That's something that we, well, the Java compiler does that for us, doesn't it? Optimization. Uh, you can do it explicitly here uh, for yourself. Okay, we are flying through here. It's, oh no. So, next, extension functions. Again, our C++ -plusers will, or C sharpers, I should say, our C++ plusers will uh, have no uh, problem with uh, extension functions. So, extension functions in Kotlin will allow you to add new functionality to existing classes. Now, they're not like Ruby's open classes, okay? For one thing, and I believe, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, one thing that a Kotlin extension cannot do is override existing functionality, okay? And it makes sense when you think about how these are actually implemented by the compiler. They're basically compiled down to static methods, okay? So the compiler will build a class. These are all, all extension methods are essentially static methods that will take the receiver as the first argument, okay? So when you think of them that way, there's no way to override existing functionality. The other thing we can do is add something called an extension property. But an extension property also cannot add new state to a, to a class for the same reason that they're statically called uh, when they're compiled down. So here we have a rather useful uh, function, which I believe is missing from the standard library uh, on the string class, which is the left pad function which um, all we do is we add the left pad function to the string class, all right? And other than uh, putting the receiver type before the function name, the function definition is exactly the same as any other function that we've already seen. The thing that you will notice, though, is this reference to this within the body of the function. And within the body of an extension function, this obviously 
points to the receiver of the function. So from here on in, we can now call left pad on any string, uh, any string object that we have, which I think you'll agree uh, should be in the standard library, and I don't know why it's not there. Someone, you know, someone's going to download it from some. Let's not talk about. It. Let's not be on JavaScript anymore. So, the thing to remember, extensions, both extension functions and extension properties are resolved statically. So, effectively, the Kotlin provider or the Kotlin uh, compiler is doing nothing more than building a Java class with lots of uh, static methods in it, with the receiver being the first parameter on that, uh, that list. This is one of these cases where the Kotlin compiler is building something that you would build as a Java developer normally. Okay? We always have those lists of something util dot Java, right? Date util, string util, anyone? Rather than have lots of util classes, we simply add extension methods to existing classes in Kotlin. As we said, important to remember, extensions cannot override existing behavior. You can only add behavior. And remember as well, because of the first point, you can only add static behavior. Uh, to, new, uh, to existing classes as well. Properties we haven't actually talked about, but a property in Kotlin is very much like a C-sharp property. Um, it's, a, um, uh, it's a field, if you like. It's got a backing field with uh, generated getters and setters, which can be overridden the same way. So you can add an extension property uh, to a class as well, or to an object. Um, the downside here being, again, because of point one, they're only static. You cannot add new state to the receiver. So they effectively can only have a getter property uh, on an extension. Finally, oh my god, we haven't even looked at any actual code. Right, interoperability with Java. So you may be asking yourself the question, so we have all these, we have functions, objects now as well, whatever that means. Um, and classes. How does all this stuff work with our existing, uh, existing classes and existing Java code? Especially if I write a top level function in Kotlin, how do I call that in my Java code? And you can probably already guess how it's compiled, right? But here we have a package. This is a file called uh, image label KT in a package. So packages work exactly the same in Kotlin as they do in Java. And we've introduced a class of uh, it's a special type of class called a data class. And this, again, is where all the scalloped people go, we already have case classes. So a data class is essentially can be thought of a bit like a case class. In a data class in Kotlin, Kotlin will generate getters and setters for the properties that you pass in on the constructor there. Uh, along with some other useful parameters or useful functions like equals and hash code, and one other which we'll look at uh, later on. So we have a, a class effectively called image label. How do would we use image label, which is a Kotlin class, in Java code? And in fact, you wouldn't know that it's written in Kotlin because there it is in some Java code: image label label equals new image label dog, blah, 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 all right? So they're both, you'll notice, both the image labeler .java and image label .kt uh, are declared in the same package. So package rules remain the same. We can uh, see the image label in the same package. And so we just use it like a normal uh, a Java class. Now, the thing about Kotlin classes are those two parameters up there, uh, name and score, OK? Those are actually constructor arguments, OK? And you'll see down here, when we construct our new image label in our Java code, we pass both. How would we get right? What if we want to create an image label instance with only passing the name uh, parameter in? Is that possible? No, it's not. It's just like a, a Java class that has been de uh, constructor declared with two two parameters. That's all that we've done up there. What you can do in Kotlin, though, is provide default, uh, param or default values uh, for parameters, OK? 
So uh, it wouldn't work in this case, but uh, if you set default parameters for your con uh, constructor arguments, uh, that's a way to get around that case. But the important thing here is our image label class defined in our Kotlin file above is just used invisibly almost in our Java code down below. What happens if we move our image label uh, Kotlin class into a new package? Well, we simply import it like any other Java class. There's no, uh, no biggie there. So from a Java developer's point of view, they don't know that image label was written in Kotlin, not Java, because at the bytecode level, they're both the same. Ah, that's a very good point. What do you think? Could you pass null? That's actually a really good point. How did I not think about that? I'm going to do that right after this thing. <laughs> and we're going to see who's right. And I'm going to open a book to see. I'll take bets on what you think is going to happen. So here we have, now this time we don't have a class, okay? This is what we're talking about. This time, and it's misspelled, unbelievable. How did that get past the editors? <laughs> funk label? What's funk label image? It's fun label image is the thing. So what we have is a top level function, okay? Remember, Kotlin allows us to declare real functions. That's functions outside of classes. There's no need to have an enclosing class for your functions in Kotlin. So label image in this case is a top level function. How could we possibly ever call that from Java? All right? Anyone going to guess? Yeah. It's basically a static method call on this class called image label KT. So the compiler uh, the Kotlin compiler has created a Java class named after the Kotlin file, image label KT, and label image, which is a top level function in that file, simply becomes a static method on that class. Okay? Now, from the previous slide, we want to keep it secret that we've introduced Kotlin into the code base. Okay? And if we suddenly have classes with this big telltale KT at the end of the name, people are going to find out. So, what we'll do is this. Up at the top, we can annotate our class with a JV name annotation, which tells the Kotlin compiler what name we actually want to call the class. In this case, image label. And now, our label image function simply becomes a static method on the image label class, okay? And our dastardly plans are once again secret, and no one need ever know that we have infected our code base with Kotlin. So, interoperability. All functions, classes, and objects are interoperable. Inter work both ways. Top-level functions, as we've seen, are resolved statically. So they pretty much work the same way as the extension functions. And as we've seen, Kotlin, the Kotlin compiler will generate a class that contains any uh, top-level functions and uh, basically create those as static methods on that class. Now, something we didn't see there is another restriction from Java is done away with in Kotlin. Okay. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not even going to ask because it's, it's embarrassing to ask. In Java, we can only have one public class in a file, right? And that class must be named the same as the file name. Kotlin has no such restrictions. Okay, Kotlin, you can have as many public classes as you like uh, declared in a single uh, source file. And you can mix and match top level functions with that if you want. And everything simply gets compiled down to individual classes at the bytecode level. Okay, so Kotlin basically separates how code is, yep. Sorry, how long were you sitting there with that? Oh, that's okay. There are none. 
you uh, primary types, as in you mean the. Yeah. An int can be nullable in Kotlin only if you've declared it as nullable in Kotlin, or do you mean the other way around? So the way the way it works is yes, by default, anything coming from Java into Kotlin is automatically marked as nullable because there is no way for you to know uh, otherwise, or no way for anyone to impose anything else. So if you're calling Java code from your Kotlin code, all those will by default uh, be marked as nullable. Now something, yep. No, no, that's fine. I think of yes. Uh, oh yeah, you're right. We can't keep it secret unless we write bug-free code. <laughs> no, there. You're right. No, it will show up, but the. Uh, Yes, you can, because uh, the Kotlin compiler will also uh, build debug information into classes it produces as well. Okay, So especially if you're using IntelliJ, it's kind of like you're, everyone's going to use IntelliJ and the Kotlin compiler to write their Kotlin, right? So the tools in uh, IntelliJ are very good. The debugger is excellent in IntelliJ as well. And you can uh, just um, invisibly switch between or debug through your Java code and your Kotlin code. Okay, good question though. Um, there are a few caveats. I can't remember what they are. Oh, I've, I've listed them. Shit. Okay, so generics. Um, there are a few things that uh, Kotlin does with generics, which we don't really have time to go into. Um, Kotlin changes the syntax around generic wildcards, for instance, but they compile down to the same thing. So um, for uh, Kotlin uses uh, keyword in and out on generics uh, to uh, specify variant and covariant and invariant, covariant. Thank you, covariant and contravariant types. Um, so it uses out and in for the, rather than the wildcards and super and extends that we have in Java, okay? Uh, I'm trying to think what I meant by caveats, generics, and interoperability. Move on. Uh, Kotlin keywords. So for instance, Kotlin has a, um, when is a keyword in, in Kotlin. So if you're calling Kotlin code um, uh, in Java, or sorry, if you're calling Java code in Kotlin and you have a method called when, for instance, how do you do that when when is a keyword? And there are actually keywords, Java keywords are escaped in your Kotlin code. So if you're unlucky enough to see this in Kotlin code, it's basically the keyword escaped by backticks in the middle of a function call. It looks really horrendously bad. Um, companion object functions. So uh, the Scala people, who were where again? So I can duck. Um, so you'll, you're happy enough with companion objects as well, okay? So Kotlin introduces companion objects, which is essentially in reducing a static part of, of, a, of a class, okay? Um, there is some, uh, some irregularity, shall we say, around how, uh, depending on how you name your companion object functions, um, how they're named in Java or how they're called in Java. You have to, I believe, refer to the companion object in your Java code. So it just makes it slightly more verbose uh, when you're calling your Kotlin code in Java. Oh, uh, I thought I'd take this slide out. Um, the reason it's here is because uh, my boss, who's up there, um, was really taken with data classes. So I thought I'd, I'd add this. Uh, so we've already talked about data classes and what they are, okay? Uh, data class is synonymous uh, with, pretty much, with case classes, okay? So we'll create a, uh, an instance of our, our class person called boss. Boss is a how's it been declared? With a val. So it's immutable. Can I set boss to another value? No, I cannot. What if I want to? Case classes create the copy method for you, the copy function, which is okay. It's just like, uh, yes, Diana's my wife. Um, 
copy function is just like a copy method in, in Java, okay? But the copy method in Kotlin, the one that's generated, allows you to set some of the values in the copy while you copy it. So essentially, you end up with a new instance of person with all the values of the original except the ones that you've overridden in the called copy. So we still have immutable types, but we have mutable immutable types. And the other thing that uh, uh, data classes uh, give you is uh, destructuring, okay? So real boss is uh, my wife. And because it's been declared, uh, because the person type has been declared as a data class, the Kotlin compiler has uh, added a couple of extra parameters to our class called component one, two, three, blah, blah, blah. And because it has that, it allows us to destructure the instance into separate variables. So first name, last name, we'll take the values from uh, the real boss instance there. And yes, they have to be in the, the order they were declared in the constructor, okay? <laughs> Three minutes. Uh, okay, so this is um, a really simple example. And I'm not even saying this is either idiomatic or particularly good code, but it's an example of maybe some of the things that we've talked about and covering some of the things that we haven't so far. So the very first thing that I'm sure everyone asked was, where is PSVM? Where is my public static void method? How do I start my programs? Well, it's right there. It's a function called main, okay? It's a top-level function in this case. It could also be the function of an object, if you want. But in this case, we have our main function called main, which takes a, an array of strings. Okay, now in Kotlin, array is, will be compiled down to a uh, Java array, but Kotlin doesn't deal with primitives, okay? so. We have no primitive array in Kotlin. We use the array class instead, or the array type. So there's our main function. Taking our array, and the very first thing we're going to do is call this, well, no, hmm. This is real revision question now. What is run labeler with? How is it declared? Sorry? It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a top level function. And what are the arguments to run labeler with? Yes, the first argument is an array string, an array of string, and the second argument is a function. Yep. And no, I'll be too cruel. Can anybody think, work out what the signature of the second argument to run labeler with is? Takes two parameters. Is there anything else about those two parameters that you can work out from the rest of that code? And it's about infection. Um, oh, I was wrong. I'm looking at. Sorry, I was looking, thinking of the wrong function. That's why. And I've just given away. Damn it. So here's run labeler with. First argument is our uh, array of strings. Our second argument is a function of string int to unit. Again, our Scala people will know all about that. Unit is basically void. Um, and here we see the when construct in Kotlin. So when, again, very like the Scala when. Difference being, it's not pattern matching here, okay? There's no pattern matching in Kotlin just yet. And if anyone's Chalks that up as a win for Scala. Well, yeah, you're right. Is okay. So, when args is, is of size one, we will call our labeler function with args uh, zero and ten for a default. Otherwise, we'll call if it's size two, we'll call labeler with args one, args two, args zero, zero, one. Else, we'll simply print out an exit process. Okay. And so what does our labeler function do? 
Well, our labeler function is the second argument to our run labeler with function. We will uh, call this load image uh, function, which is down a bit. And then we're going to call label image. Now, this is a bit, uh, it's already there, it's on screen, so you'll maybe, oh no, you won't see. Oh, you won't see. Okay. So, label image is another, we're on line 27 here. Label image takes how many arguments? Three. Takes image content and max results and a third argument, which is a function. Based on that, can you work out or determine anything special about how the arguments to our uh, parameters are declared there? Line 28 would be your clue. So, these two arguments here, labels and error, how are they declared, their types, how are their types declared? They're both nullable, yeah. Okay. So here is our label image function down here. And we'll see that the third argument to label function is our function here called process results. And the two arguments to that are, oh, I totally ignored you, didn't I? I told you to throw that at me. Here it comes, oh, smack, okay. Uh, true to form, I've run out of time. Um, okay, so the important thing, what uh, if we scroll quickly through this, and you'll not work out what it's doing because I haven't had a chance to run it, but it's basically calling the Google Vision API with an image, okay? But what do you not notice about this class? There is no classes, yeah. Everything's done on top level functions in this, okay? The uh, Label image function. She's gone. Okay. So if we look over at this Java class, which is just a basic drop wizard uh, class, okay? So in this drop wizard class, I want to use the label image function from our previous Kotlin file, okay? And so if I go down to my resource down here, we'll see I simply make a call to label image, which has been statically imported at the top of the file. So I have a Java drop wizard app using Kotlin code, which I wrote before, using all the interoperability stuff that we looked at previously. And then I did, this is the end, promise that we would look at an Android uh, app. So here's the main activity for an Android app written in Kotlin, okay? And the only takeaway from this, the code looks exactly like the Kotlin code that we looked at before. I thought I heard her come back, um, is we have used a library called Anko, which is a Kotlin uh, UI library. <laughs> you wouldn't think it's a 1.0 release, would you? Kotlin 3 and Uncaught empty throwable. Okay. So uh, Anko allows you to declare your, your UIs in code rather than XML. Okay, so, uh, so that turned into a bit of a flying visit through Kotlin. We have no time for questions. Any questions? <laughs> he asked me a question, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, is this for the, yeah. the null thing? Yeah. So it doesn't complain, but you get a runtime error. Uh, okay, so it's null pointer. Yeah, screw null pointers. You're wrong, but null pointers. Okay, sorry for uh, the rush at the end. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much.